Yeah. So the, this is tutorial. Uh, it's supposed to be given by Yasu Nakamura, but he's too busy to come. So I, I thank him for giving me opportunity <laughs> to be a speaker. Um, OK, so uh, let me start from this, this article uh, written by uh, Keith Schwab and Michael Lucas, 2005. The title is Putting Mechanics into Quantum Mechanics. So it was 2005, and the, the entire quantum mechanics activity is still in the, on the horizon. So the, uh, it's very in the stage of infancy. But now, uh, 2018, we have witnessed a tremendous development like um, those two milestone experiment of a ground state cooling of mechanics. And people now start to talk about the entanglement between two separate mechanical oscillators. So uh, here we are more or less interested in spins and the magnons. So the natural question is uh, whether we can put the magnonics into quantum magnonics. That's my topic. And uh, I split my, my talk into two parts. The first part is about cavity quantum magnonics, which is basically the low temperature microwave experiment. And the latter half is about the new possibility of optomagnonics. OK. And there are uh, other activities, uh, what we are doing. And uh, like mag magnetic quasi vortex or magnetic crystal. If you are interested in, please ask those guys, their audience. Okay, so uh, about cavity um, quantum magnetics. So let's start uh, by reminding you about what is magnet. So this is the, the simplest. Hamiltonian which describe the ferromagnet. There is a two parts, two, two terms. The, the second term is the Zeeman energy. This is simple. And the first, first term is the exchange energy. <coughs> and this is not uh, apparently a <coughs> diagonal uh, Hamiltonian. We can diagonalize this Hamiltonian by uh, invoking this uh, famous Primakov Holstein pre trans transformation, then we can get this kind of uh, harmonic oscillator type excitation. And that is magnon. But what particular, what, what is the interesting is that this dispersion is not simple. It's quadratic, which represents that the um, adjacent spin, you know, if you flip the adjacent spin, costs a lot of energy. So that's why. Uh, without exchange, the, the dispersion is just flat. That's, that's co correspond to the paramagnet case. But ferromagnet, the dispersion is quadratic. That's the important difference. And we are um, interested in the magnetos magnetostatic regime, so-called, and which is in the long <laughs> wavelength limit. And then Maxwell equation becomes static except for this M. M is the magnetization, and the magnetization follows the landau lipschitz equation. That's only the dynamical part. And if we apply the DC magnetic field, then we can even linearize uh, this complicated coupled equation, and as a result, uh, we, can, we can set up the uh, so-called Walker equation regarding, uh, with respect to this um, magnetic potential. And the solutions are known as a Walker modes. And the simplest one is this Kittel mode. This is just, just uniformly oscillating mode. But not just that, but there are several other modes, which already James uh, very nicely explained uh, yesterday. OK, so how to reveal magnons? How to reveal electricity? 
magnetostatic mode. That is ferro ferromagnetic resonance, fMR. So suppose, to be concrete, we have um, heterium ion garnet, eek. Uh, this is the typical uh, yes, supermaterial and insulator. And applying a magnetic field around, let's say, this direction. And, and by coil, we excite the, um, the magnetostatic mode. You know, this AC magnetic field uh, perpendicular to this one and excite, let's say, the Kittel mode. And if you look at the microwave reflection, what we get is this kind of uh, ferromagnetic resonance at particular frequency, which correspond to the fMR frequency, the Kittel mode resonant frequency. What if we put this Higgs <coughs> sphere in a cavity? What happened? Instead of coil, we can use the cavity, microwave cavity. What happened? What happened is that now we have two harmonic oscillators, the, the magnon and microwave field, photons. And if the coupling is strong enough, uh, we expect that those two modes hybridize and we expect the normal mode splitting. And this is what, what we get. And this uh, yeah, already showed several times. But uh, the, the thing is that if we change the magnum frequency by changing the applied uh, DC magnetic field, and Kittel mode change the frequency like this, and if this hit the cavity mode, there's a splitting. It's a famous beast <laughs> we, we've been talking about. And the different way is uh, saying is that this splitting means that the Kittel mode and the cavity mode exchange energy more rapidly than any other uh, decay rate. So this is one of the, um, the requirement for putting magnonics into a quantum wave gene in a way. But this is just two harmonic oscillators and two harmonic oscillators uh, lead to just again kind of a two harmonic oscillator. So uh, we have this linear energy level structure and this is basically the classical correspondence limit. So things get more interesting if we put another element, another a harmonic element, qubit, in the same cavity. What is like this qubit? Qubit, superconducting qubit, is a kind of LC circuit. But LC circuit itself is just a harmonic oscillator, again. But if we replace this inductance uh, to Josephson junction, Josephson junction can be considered as a nonlinear inductance so that the potential becomes nonlinear and the equidistance energy level becomes in equidistance energy. And we can consider this lowest two levels as a two level system. That's basically the qubit. And this is the uh, picture of the qubit, superconducting qubit. This is basically the aluminum part. This is kind of big. And in, in between, we have a Josephson junction. And, and this part corresponds to the capacitance, and this Josephson junction is a nonlinear inductance in a way. And this is the set, um, SEM um, force color image of this uh, Josephson junction. Okay, so uh, we put this superconducting qubit at the antinode of the electric field of this cavity, while this X sphere is put in the antinode of the uh, magnetic field of this cavity and let them interact. The situation is something like this. So the qubit coupled to the cavity by you know, famous circuit QED type interaction. And as I said before, the cavity and the magnons are strongly coupled to harmonic oscillator coupled. But now, uh, let this cavity adiabatically eliminate by detuning, keeping these two states, two, two, two guides resonant. 
what happened is that these two start to virtually interact. And now, we have now a two-level system and harmonic oscillator. As a result, we expect this kind of James Cummings rather. So not anymore the linear energy spectrum, but nonlinear type of rather we can get. And if we look at this uh, two lowest level, this is called the vacuum Rabi splitting. And what we get experimentally is this uh, qubit and magnons Rabi splitting. But this Rabi splitting is not coming from the photons zero point of fluctuation, but this uh, coming from the magnons vacuum fluctuation. Magnons back, vacuum uh, fluctuation influence the qubit uh, energy. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the re resonance case. And the, the coupling between qubit and the magnons can be evaluated by this energy splitting. It's about eight megahertz. And if we look at the model, so we have a Kitter mode and qubit, and there is a two different cavity modes. And, and we know all the coupling strengths. And from here, uh, theoretically, we can get this value. So this is fairly cross. And if we, you know, this coupling is kind of strong enough so that even of resonant regime, we can still have some interesting physics. So uh, if we shift the operating point, uh, we, are interested, we were interested in this, but now interested in here. What happened? What happened is the coupling is changed from the resonant to dispersive. And dispersive regime, the most important characteristic is uh, parameterized by the sky. And what is the sky? The chi is basically uh, the value uh, that the, uh, the qubit, uh, actually, the, okay, so first, magnon's energy now depends on the qubit state and depends on grand state or excited state, the magnon frequency actually changed by chi. And on the other hand, the qubit frequency is also depends on the magnons number. And um, the, the shift is also a, a bar, a characterized by chi. So the important point is that now the qubit frequency is dependent on the magnon number. So we can use this as a magnon counter. So um, this is the uh, the, the spectro spectroscopy, uh, the result of the spe spectroscopy. Um, the lower graph shows the, there's no magnon excitation, just a vacuum. And then we have one uh, you know, frequency. But if we depress the magnon, meaning that we derive the magnon a little bit, then the qubit start to broaden, but this the way of broadening is the discretized. And we can sort of map out what, how, how many magnets actually excited. So this is in a way a kind of a light shift, but uh, usual light shift, we can't count the number of light, number of photons. But it's the, the, the car is large enough, then the light shift becomes discretized and we can count the number of Magnons. So this is one of the uh, example of quantum magnonics because we are now counting the magnon number. So uh, these are already probably you, some of you knows uh, this already, but uh, there's some new developments uh, of quantum magnonics. So uh, the first thing is that to further proceed quantum magnonics, we have to understand well about the uh, decay mechanism, magnons uh, line with this, where this line with this come from. 
and we had some gain. We had uh, we had got some uh, insight uh, of the uh, line widths uh, at the extremely low temperature regime, and and in this in this relatively high temperature yeah high temperature uh, region, uh, people already know that this mainly coming from the impurities uh, of resonant interaction. So that called uh, slow relaxation and also phonon contribution uh, is responsible for this region. But this, okay, that one is the real experiment and the, the surprisingly at lower temperature, we observed this uh, increase of the line widths. And that's actually uh, coming from the two level system, the residual two level system. Um, and uh, not just that, but uh, extra offset that coming from the magnum magnum scattering. That's probably due to the Kitter mold has a, a lot of uh, degenerate modes around, same frequency, and those two modes are coupled via uh, the defect around the surface. So uh, this is new insight. but to further gain more insight, uh, it's probably better to reconstruct the uh, quantum state of magnum. So uh, one of the example is the Q, Q function. Because the relaxation is this way. So this, so this is the magnum state, this is the phase space of the magnum, and this is this displaced, and this may relax to the uh, vacuum. But there may be a dephasing, so we don't know. And total line with this may come from this relaxation plus this dephasing. And to, to, uh, to, to understand this, it's better to resort to the tomography of magnum state. So in order to implement tomography, we use uh, this coupled system. So the magnum is now again, coupled to qubit, and the qubit and the cavity act as a measurement device. So, how it works? Uh, so, suppose we are initially prepare the magnum state in the vacuum. So this is one of the things, the quantum magnetics is kind of easier than the quantum mechanics because the magnum's resonant frequency is 10 gigahertz, just put the magnum in the direction of which automatically we can prepare the uh, ground state. We don't need to, to, to do any ground state cooling, just put the direction of which, put it in the direction of which. So prepare the vacuum state and displace the magnum, uh, displace the uh, state at certain uh, amplitude and phase, let's say, and let them evolve. And this is the crucial part, the measurement, how to do that. So this, uh, there are three steps, okay? The first step is to move the origin. And with this state, we try to uh, measure the overlap between this state and <coughs> the vacuum state. And how to do that? How to do that is the, the following. So the displacement, the or, origin displacement is just a, you know, the negative way of displacing the magnum state. This can be done easily. And then uh, this is the crucial part. So we have the magnum and qubit uh, coupled system and we can, and we resolve the magnum number. So we uh, select the qubit, a state which correspond to the zero magnum state and conditionally flip the qubit, okay? And then measure the, the excited state of the qubit by lead out cavity. And by doing that, we basically uh, measure the overlap between the, 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 the zero state, vacuum state, and this evolved state. And we repeat this procedure by uh, with several different alpha, alpha two, 
and do the measurement and alpha 3 and do the measurement. And we can then construct the Magnon's Q function. So this is one of the example. And, and this is the, the reconstructed dynamics of the Magnon state. And this starts from around here and, and decays down to uh, ground state. So we have to analyze this and we have no uh, clear answer what, where, what this uh, represents. But uh, we'll see what happened. Okay, another development was mentioning is the way of uh, tuning the coupling. So we've been using the coil. So applying the DC magnetic field and then the Kittel mode frequency actually changed. But this is kind of static way of changing the coupling. And this is slow. So we can't do interesting uh, manipulation in, in, in the time domain. But uh, we can, by all means, tune the qubit frequency by drive the qubit in off resonant fashion. But at the, at the expense that the qubit um, line widths get broadened, so we, we can find the optimal point. So this is the kind of figure, figure merit. So this is the figure merit, the, uh, the shift of the qubit frequency over the broadening of the qubit. So we, we have this nice optimal operating point, which is uh, far detuned from the uh, cavity uh, mode. But the good thing about this AC Schutterk drive method is that we can quickly change from off resonant, no interaction point, to this interacting point. And this is really powerful. And this idea coming from Patrice, and we really thank you <laughs> about this idea. So uh, this is probably the way to generate non-classical, let's say, one magnon state or maybe cat state, and etc. So we'll see again. <laughs> so the summary about the first term, first part. So uh, quantum magnetics with ferromagnet, we observe the strong coupling with microwave cavity, and we observe vacuum Rabi splitting, magnon induced, magnon vacuum Rabi splitting, and magnon number resolving spectroscopy. And in progress is the quantum state tomography of magnon and quantum magnon state generation. And these are in progress. Okay, so I'm now going to switch the topic. This is more like my, <laughs> my territory. So optomagnonics, but new possibility. Okay, so let, let me start from this uh, situation. So we have, again, let's say Ike uh, sitting here, and this may um, contain a lot of magnons inside. And let's shine the light through this way, and input field, electric field, is represented by E1, and the scattered one is represented by E2. And the effective Hamiltonian of this uh, can be described by this. Given that the light field is far off resonant to the, any optical transition inside of the EEC. Then the important point here is that, okay, so A is the cross section and C is the speed of light in the EEC. And uh, the important point here is that the, all the matters information that matters contains in this dielectric tensor. And purely phenomenological point of view, uh, this uh, shape can be determined. Symmetry requirement. So the first requirement coming from the, the hermeticity. So we assume that the interaction is off-resonant. So basically, 
the interaction is lossless, no imaginary part. So that means that if we write this um, dielectric tensor in the real part and imaginary part, and its conjugate is looking like, it look, looks like this, and then this real part has to be symmetric, and this imaginary part has to be unsymmetric in order to satisfy the hermeticity. This equal to this should be this requirement. And another requirement is the reciprocity, the Onsaga's reciprocity. That, that tells us that this, uh, the element of um, dielectric tensor, ij component for m, has to be equal to the, uh, the uh, transposed component at minus m. And that means that you know, combining those two requirements, the symmetric part has to be even powers of magnetization. Okay, so I forgot to say this m is the magnetization. The, the, the symmetric part has to be even powers of m and unsymmetric part has to be odd powers of m. Then we can expand this dielectric tensor in terms of, in the power of uh, m. The first part is uh, not dependent on m, it's just scalarized shift, so symmetric. And the next part, the, the, this one, uh, is a linear function of m, and this has to be unsymmetric, and that corresponds to the uh, vectorized shift. And third one is the tensorized shift, and that's uh, proportional to the m quadratic. And this sigma uh, is a, you know, this combination of two magnetization components, okay, and symmetrized. So if we look at this vector light shift part, it's nothing but just a rotation matrix. And this is responsible for the Faraday effect. While this tensor part is looking complicated, but if we decompose, if we delete this in a different way, and we can recognize that this is very much like a stress tensor. And aforementioned sigmas are strain tensor. And those two are related by stiffness matrix. And we are dealing with cubic crystal like YAG. The stiffness components, stiffness like components of Kotomuto effect, tensorized shift, has only three independent parameters G11, G12, and G44. So from here, let's understand the DC response, one magnon response, and two magnon processes. And the DC response um, coming from the, uh, the magnetization only, that only depends on, only rely on MZ. Let's suppose that the magnetization, mean magnetization is along the Z direction. Then only the component which is which contains MZ and nothing else uh, can be contributed. And this is basically the DC part of the effect, and this uh, tensor part uh, is responsible for the DC Kotomuto effect. And one magnum process is for those components which contains MX or MY once, and those are these. And these are the, uh, the famous AC or dynamic Faraday effect, this responsible, and this is the DC, uh, sorry, dynamic or AC Kotomuto effect. So one magnum process can be uh, categorized into two, the anti-stock scattering or stock scattering, where the magnum is annihilated here or created here. Okay, so this is, basically the central position of yesterday's uh, talks about uh, cavity optomagnetics. We are 
predominantly interested in the one magnum process. So what about two magnum processes? You can see that there is a two magnum components. So like that contains mx or my twice. And the vector part or the scalar part, there's nothing. But there's some components for this tensor part. And that leads to some interesting two magnum processes. So two magnum processes is like this. So everywhere the two magnum and two photons are interacting. What is good for? What is good for is related to the, the one of the yeah, related relevant topic, topics would be magnum BC as um, Professor Hilbert uh, explained the magnum BC can be created by parametric pumping. So create the pump at two omega place and then the magnum can be, um, two magnons are created. This is microwave process and, and this decays, uh, the, this pumped magnons decays via four magnum processes. But this cross section is kind of small. So this is roughly According to Kittel's textbook, it's kind of small, 10 to the minus 25 uh, cubic uh, square centimeter. So I hope that uh, this two magnum process, brilliant scattering, can accelerate the formation of BC. That's one motivation. So then the question is who have ever observed two magnum processes. And it turns out that very old, 1966, those guys observed. But this is the antiferromagnet. I don't know much about antiferromagnet, so now I'm talking uh, you know, a dangerous uh, you know, territory. <laughs> but uh, my understanding is the following. So uh, they observe two peaks uh, for the uh, conventional uh, Raman type of experiment. And this one corresponds to the following process. So let's assume that there's a very overly simplified optical magnet dispersion for this uh, ferromagnet. And this is the gamma point, and those are the um, uh, brilliant uh, zone edge. And they claim that this, this peak coming from the following process. So the, uh, the, from gamma point, we excite the light and they saw this scattered light, or maybe other way around. And that appears here. So this magnum correspond to the zone center magnum. While this big one, they claimed to be a following two magnum processes because the frequency, uh, this is about two, yeah, 4.6 terahertz and just about half they observe, they, they know the, the zone, uh, zone edge magnums actually correspond to this frequency. So, uh, this is kind of anomaly because single magnum is smaller than two magnum. And they uh, say that there's some weird process, so-called exchange scattering, because this is antiferromagnet and the adjacent, adjacent uh, two lattices. Uh, yeah, the excited state kind of weird. So. <laughs> This leads to this strange effect. And people are interested in this uh, very much at uh, 70s or uh, 60s. But there are no uh, ferromagnets, uh, uh, no report of two magnum. Maybe there are, but to, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, there are no uh, two magnum experiments, two magnum scattering experiments in the ferromagnet. So we launched to, to observe this. So uh, the one magnum scattering, the, the geometry is something like this. 
Okay, so this is the, uh, the previous one, so the one, one magnum. So here again, the X sphere, and we excite the uh, magnum along Z direction. And input polarization is linear, and, and due to the Faraday effect, this is uh, after propagate, uh, this oscillate, this polarization, plane of polarization oscillate at the frequency of magnum. And we can get this oscillation by putting polarization beam splitter and fast detector and get this uh, oscillating light intensity. And usually we excite the magnum at magnum frequency, omega m, and look at the signal at omega m. But now we change the geometry a little bit. So now the, the bias magnetic field is along the light path and, and derive uh, in the same way. But we, our input states are either sigma plus or sigma minus photon, not the linear polarization. And look at this ellipticity by, by using quarter wave plate and, and PBS. And the crucial difference is now is that we derive the uh, omega m, let's say, and then look at the two omega m. And not just that, but we are also interested in the uh, sideband asymmetry. So we, in order to separate the blue sideband and red sideband, we prepare, to, so, so not, nothing happened, then the carrier frequency actually uh, the scatter into two omega m and two omega m in the red side and blue side. But to separate this, uh, we put the uh, local oscillator by splitting the light and put the AOM and shift the frequency and look at this beat between local oscillator and red one and local oscillator and blue one. And that's the experimental setup. And the beat signal now different so we can distinguish. So this is the result. Uh, so uh, the, the now we have to be a little bit careful because uh, the, the cotton muton effect, the what, tensorized shift depends on the, the, yeah, the characterized by three parameters, G11, G12, and G44. So we have to be careful about what's the crystal orientation uh, with respect to the magnetic magnetization. And in this experiment, we use the magnetic field along the 111 direction of the EEG. And the blue one is correspond to the uh, blue shifted sideband, and the red one is the red shifted sideband. And sigma plus, the first, uh, you know, this one, this uh, first uh, alphabet <laughs> is corresponds to the initial polarization and this one is the measured polarization. And uh, we expect that uh, these two uh, configuration will see the scattering, but some, somehow we, we saw some residual uh, signal. I don't know yet, but, but the, the point is that these two uh, peaks corresponding to the following situation. So the red one, the red sidebands at two omega uh, correspond to the, this kind of situations. The photon is comes in and the two magnons are scattered and this light is, comes out at two omega, slightly uh, red shifted. And blue one correspond to the, the other, uh, the opposite uh, processes. So two magnons comes in and let the photon in, and then we get this. Okay. So uh, this is slightly different from what the ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnet uh, situation uh, was. So uh, this situation is the following. So we excite uh, by blue light, and we get this red light. But those two magnons are uh, sitting at the gamma point because we are interested in the uh, magnetostatic mode and 
no dispersion. No, basically, we are not so interested in dispersion. And the, the, and the light geometry is collinear, so nothing uh, strange happens. So this simple situation. While this blue one is the opposite one. So the input light is red, and look at this blue one. OK. So uh, now we change the a magnetization direction uh, to 111 direction and do the similar experiment and we get this result. And again, the most relevant uh, configuration is this sigma plus goes to sigma minus or sigma minus goes to sigma plus. And the, the scattering strength is, let's say, about uh, minus 70 dBm and which is actually quite similar to this uh, one, one, one zero zero case. And that, yes. Uh, that's basically the, the this, you know, our instrument is not perfectly phase uh, locked. So sometimes uh, it's fractured, you know, in, in, in the ideal situation, it's delta function. So why don't I see the magnetron? Because we, we, we excite uh, the magnetron coherently. So, yeah, because, because our configuration is, yeah, so this way. So we derive the magnetron at omega, and this is the uh, delta function. So what I wanted to say here is that the scattering strengths for one zero zero and one 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 is more or less the same. What that mean? What that means is that we don't have to careful what we, we don't have to uh, consider the cubic, but more like the magnum, you know, the, the e sphere for the cotton muton effect, this coefficient is more like isotropic. So we just have two parameters, like Lame constant. So, uh, so in other words, uh, G1, G44 and G11 minus G12 is more or less the same number. So one equation eliminates one uh, constant and lead to this isotropic. OK. So the finally, a little bit earlier, but finally I showed you, uh, I, I show you the uh, magnum mode transfer. Not just two kitter mode, but, um, two kitter mode created or two kitter mode annihilated. We can use the similar uh, mechanism to transfer the different magnum modes. So now uh, we derive the uh, eq at Kitten mode frequency as well as a two two zero mode frequency, and what we are looking at is the difference frequency of those. And this is the result. Uh, so, um, so again, there is uh, two parts: the blue sideband and the red sideband. And but what is interesting is. Yeah, the, according to the, uh, our phenomenological account, the selection rule tells us that those two uh, <coughs> configurations, we see some scattering, and these two correspond to the following situation. So the red one corresponds to the 111, the Kitter mode comes in, and due to the two magnum process, uh, the 220 magnum is created. On the other hand, this blue one corresponds to 220 magnum comes in and 111 Kitter mode uh, comes out. So we successfully uh, you know, uh, observed these two magnum processes and we are trying to, uh, to create. This is not the creation of this mode actually because we derive those two and look at this one and derive those two and look at this one. This, those are the results. But 
if we derive those two photons simultaneously, and at the same time we derive this, let's say, 110 Kittelmond magnum, and to create this magnum, and look at the microwave uh, comes out from the magnum, that really tells us that we create this magnum. And that really lead to the interesting uh, yeah, uh, prospect to use this process for the accelerate the four, four body scattering. Okay, so, uh, yeah. And okay, so finally, two magnum scattering in the, uh, this diagram uh, correspond to two, okay, so this process correspond to two, two, zero magnum is excited and uh, and these two photons connect uh, and create uh, one zero zero magnet. And that's what we see here. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, a little bit early, but uh, I, let's, let, uh, let me conclude uh, the, uh, by showing the team. So this is the group leader, Yas Nakamura, and this is the entire group at this year, uh, the April. And the first half of the talk, uh, the main uh, people who work uh, are the, those three guys, the Itaka Tabuchi and Seichiro Ishino and Danny Lashian's Quirion. It's very difficult to pronounce, but I mastered. And especially uh, the, the recent progress is heavily due to Danny and uh, and the two magnum uh, scattering, uh, this is done by, uh, or the tedious job is done by, was done by Ryusuke Satomi, and he's been working hard, and he will be working hard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>